Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with ABS master bladesmith, James Rodabaugh. I was introduced to James by Matt Chase of Hogtooth Knives while at Blade Show 2024, and he's enamored with James's work. And coming from Matt, that means a lot to me, as you probably know. After ambling over to his table at Blade Show, being gobsmacked by his beautiful knives, and then having a brief conversation with him, I saw immediately why Matt introduced me to James. I'm honored to have Mr. Rodaba on the show to talk about his life in knives. But be uh, first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and download the show to your favorite podcast app. And uh, we'll see you over at Patreon if you're interested in helping uh, helping out the show monetarily. Go over there and check out what we have to offer. It's a pretty great deal. Uh, go to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, that's thenifejunkie.com slash patreon adventure delivered your monthly subscription for hand-picked outdoor survival edc and other cool gear from our expert team of outdoor professionals the knife junkie.com slash battle box james welcome to the show thanks i'm glad to be here yeah it's it's good to have you here uh we had a brief conversation at blade show uh but uh as soon as you started telling me like I'll I'll come on your show, but first I have to start on my Alaskan cabin. I was like, oh man, I can't wait to talk to this guy. Yeah, yeah, we just got back. Actually, it was pretty brutal. Um, the road ends about a half mile from the property, and we had to uh, basically we were walking bear trails in with pretty heavy loads, and then uh, we had a lot of clearing to do. Uh, huge trees, um, probably 180 foot tall. 36 inches or so through the through the trunk um one tree we cut uh was actually seven foot across at the at the root ball Um, wow so it was hard work we didn't get the cabin built we're gonna have to chopper everything in next year but we got the land cleared built a, a lz for all of our materials and uh we'll get that done i got to got to use a knife or two while I was doing it. So it's pretty cool. Nice. So you, you went up to Alaska, you, you brought materials up there, humped it in, and then you cleared an area and created an LZ for the helicopter that's going to bring in the rest of your materials. It sounds uh, like you're going about this in a pretty methodical way. Uh, you wouldn't have happened to have served in the U S Marine Corps. Did you? Uh, yeah. If you can see that there. Um, yeah, I did four years in the Corps um from 82 to 86 and uh it was a great thing for me i was kind of a a misguided youth and and uh it it kind of got me on the straight and narrow so really a good deal for me so does that mean you were always uh into knives into uh the outdoors that kind of thing um my father was a very avid hunter and and gun dog trainer um and my grandfather was a fur buyer. So I grew up in a family of, of woodsmen, outdoorsmen. Um, I started hunting with a, a pellet gun when I was seven and uh, just kind of kept going. And here I am 53 years later, still doing the same thing. My toys are a little bit more expensive, but uh, you know, I'm still pretty much doing the same thing, looking for adventure. Um, I enjoy um, feeding my family and myself from from the forest and the fields. Uh, so it's kind of a lifestyle for me. Yeah, yeah. Always looking for adventure. So how how did knives work into this? How did it come to pass that you decided to make your professional life? And you know that's obviously very personal about knives. Um, well, it, it kind of happened by accident, really. Um, while I was in the Marine Corps before I went overseas, uh, my father happened to meet a gentleman named Jimmy Lyle. And uh, dad bought a couple of Lyle knives, one for myself, one for my brother. And I carried that knife all over uh, Asia, North Africa. Um, 
all over the United States. And uh, uh, I remember sitting under a big old tree while I was going through Jess School, which is jungle environment survival training. And I was looking at that knife and I thought, you know, this is really cool. This guy's achieved a, a small measure of immortality. Yeah. Um, and and of course, in the jungle, obviously, we were using knives. Uh, I was using a bolo um, and and I that was hand forged. And I thought, wow, it'd be really cool to do that someday. So uh, my son asked me if I could make him a knife and I I beat a little knife out on a tiny anvil on my vice with a claw hammer and a, a propane torch and somebody saw it and said wow that's really cool can you make me one and i did and they were horrible i mean i hope nobody ever sees them um but uh i realized i didn't know enough to make a proper knife and i started studying uh for about three years i read everything i could find on metallurgy and forging and design and uh then i bought a forge and anvil and never looked back um, you you mentioned jimmy lyle uh your first or one of your first knives given to you by your dad by jimmy lyle and he's one of the he's he made the first rambo knife you know he, right. he's a right. legend that guy um, as a matter of fact it was really cool i had big props from the fellas over in okinawa because first blood came out and they were all tripping on the rambo knife and I said, I've got a knife made by that guy. And they all thought I was, of course, lying. And, and I showed them. So I, I got some some pretty good strokes out of that. What, what was that knife like? What did it look like? Um, it was his smaller hunter, um, probably a four-inch blade, uh, antique ivory micarta. Oh. Um, his uh, pouch style sheath, he had another name for it. I forget what it was called. Um, I still have the knife. Um, it was stolen at one point when I was in the Marine Corps, and uh, I ended up finding the guy that did it and and got it back. So nice, nice. Yeah. I'd love to hear the story about that sometime. Maybe in the interview extras for uh, for our Patreon members. But you mentioned while you're sitting there uh, in Okinawa looking at this Lyle. Uh, mm -hmm. Lyle knife that you're like, you had this realization, wow, this man achieved some level of immortality. What did you mean by that? Well, Jimmy's been gone a long time now, but if you're a knife guy, you know who Jimmy Lyle is. He, he has achieved his name at least, and his reputation as a maker has achieved a level of immortality. Um, some, a legacy, if you will. Um, and I think that's really cool. Is there is there something about making uh, something with the sort of permanence of a knife that um, makes it a worthwhile, makes it a more worthwhile creative pursuit to you? Uh, I mean, we're going to get to everything about it. I, I guess I'm I'm jumping in a little deep here, but but oh, we're here right. already, and and it's like uh, you know you can make a painting, and it's useful uh, for looking at and considering and and admiring but you can't cut a sandwich with it or skin a deer. So for me to create a uh, functional art, um, I, I'm a bladesmith, a master bladesmith, but I'm a, a pretty serious uh, admirer of fine sporting arms. And, and those guns are amazingly functional they're the epitome of the gunmaker's art and they're unbelievably useful in the field um so my ethos in knife making kind of revolves around that i'm inspired by the guns that i own and use um and my i try to reflect that level of of usefulness and art into my knives I mean, you uh, you're you're talking about these rifles to me, and it's like the one of the guns we were talking about behind you, but also like the very expensive bird guns that I've seen with beautiful wooden furniture and carvings and mm -hmm. and all that kind of thing. Um, uh, is is this uh, this is the kind of thing that inspires you? Um, Absolutely. Um, I've been very fortunate in my life. Uh, I've I've done 
very well for a, a high school dropout that went in Marine Corps at 17. Um, and I've been able to afford the type of firearms that I enjoy, and they're fairly high dollar. Um, I, I collect English um, field guns, and I collect also uh, German sporting arms. Uh, but though I say I collect them, they are all used in the field. Um, I don't have a safe queen uh, in the lot. They are all used. Okay, so let's 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 start from the beginning of your career. Let's let's find out how you actually got into knives and how you, where you start. I mean, I, you told me that you you beat out a blade on a an anvil that was integrated into your vice. Uh, but how, how did the decision? How did you make the decision to really uh, dive in? So um, at the time, I was working uh, for the Department of Justice, Federal Bureau of Prisons, and. Uh, I'd been doing it for, I think at that point, right around 11 or 12 years, something like that. And uh, I, I needed uh, something to, to uh, relax with after a long day. And uh, forging for me was an escape from that. Uh, as time went on, I got a little better and I I got some help from a gentleman named Elman T. Barton, uh, ABS Master Bladesmith. Um, and as I started to refine my work, uh, at the same time that was occurring, uh, I was getting, uh, I was bringing the job home. I was bringing it outside the wall, so to speak. Um, you might imagine that that kind of job doesn't lend uh, itself to being, uh, to trusting people, uh, mm -hmm. to taking any kind of guff from anybody. And, and I didn't like who I was becoming. Um, and I really had no, no other skills, um, other than I'm a pretty fair hand in a, in a kitchen. Um, and, uh, my wife said, you need to get out of that. Why don't you go full time? And, and I laughed and I said, you know, the odds of me being able to support a family on a knife maker salary are slim and none. And uh, she said, well, I can handle it until you can sell enough knives to to provide. Um, and so off I went. Um, I left in 1999, January of 99. I became a full time maker. Um, and never looked back actually. So, so you said, uh, federal corrections, does that mean you were working uh, full time in prisons and, and that environment, you didn't like what it was turning you into? Yeah. I mean, it, it's a, it's a negative environment. I yeah. mean, you're surrounded by guys that are separated from their families. Um, some of them are really good guys that made one mistake. Some of them are really bad guys that need to be behind bars maybe forever um and when you're dealing with that it 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 can affect you you can never let your guard down um i had three contracts put on me in the entire time i worked there um none of them obviously were ever fulfilled um but uh it's just a negative environment in general. Uh, there were a few bright spots in that. Uh, there were a couple of, of uh, inmates that uh, after I left the bureau, uh, they I ran into one of them. The other one contacted me, and they're still very good friends of mine to this day. Huh. Um, good, good guys. So there's a you noticed a marked difference, obviously, uh, from being in a prison all day and doing your job there and then coming home and beating on hot steel. What was the if, if you kind of just gave us a picture of the mindset of being in the prison? What what is the mindset that you gained from doing the knife making? And then how did that uh, you know, how did that carry you forward? So for me, the independence of being a bladesmith. Um, I'm, I'm somewhat of a hermit. 
Uh, I like people. Uh, I just kind of like them in small doses. And uh, for me, the solitude of it, uh, being able to just lose yourself in the process of creating and and then at the end of it have a tool that i'm you know a person can they can bet their life on it um that is really cool to be able to do um and i i just i feel like it's a it's an art that was being lost until bill moran you know kind of fired things up again and there were other gentlemen involved as well with that um but it's saving a crop that was on its way out, at least in this country. Mm -hmm. um, and a knife is, you know, probably the probably the only tool that all of us will use at least once, twice, perhaps three times a day. Yeah. Some people, many more. Um, that that really kind of tickles me too. Um, I'm producing something. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, taking i'm producing and that and that's super important to me you mentioned uh how bill moran uh kind of brought back uh the art of knife making and definitely damascus steel making uh and you're referring to the birth i would assume of the abs uh, american bladesmith yeah. society uh, i know yeah. bill bagwell who's one of my favorite i love his bowies uh uh yeah, uh, I know he was also in on the ground floor of that. Uh, you is one of the founders, mm -hmm. and and you are, are yourself a master bladesmith, and there are not too many of you. It is a very rigorous uh, uh, and and uh, thorough process, and you're making some incredible knives that have to perform incredibly uh, to to pass. Uh, tell me about your experience with the American Bladesmith Society, how you got involved, and and uh, your involvement. So. Um... I went to my first hammer in one week after I went full time in 99 and it was an ABS hammer in out in California where I was at at the time. And, um, uh, I was exposed to a number of different master Smiths, um, Tim Hancock, Harvey Dean, um, gosh, who else was there? Um, can't remember who all else, but I know that Tim and Harvey really made an impression on me because of their knives. They were amazing. And I was fortunate enough to actually work with both of them at, you know, on, at their amble at that hammer end. Um, and, and Al Barton, who was the gentleman that I was apprenticing under at the time was also an ABS master bladesmith. And, uh, it, it just, it was a goal for me. Um, my father asked me where I intended to go with this craft. And, um, and I said, well, I'm gonna be one of the best in the world. Um, that was what I hoped for. And I'm still hoping for, I'm still trying to, to reach that level. Um, Master Smith is kind of the beginning, really. Um, it just, you know, you've gotten to that point and you are, very good at what you do, but there's so much room to improve. Um, always, uh, look at these young guys that are coming up now. They're amazing. Um, and, and us old guys got a hump to keep up with them. Well, they're, they're standing on the shoulders of giants, uh, for sure. Uh, in yourself and others. It's funny you say that, uh, being a uh, master bladesmith is just the beginning. Cause I've heard a lot of martial arts instructors say like getting your black belt that that's the beginning that's uh, now you know how to walk you've been crawling this whole time uh, and i think i think a lot of them meant to say like now is the point where you can be creative with this because you've mastered all of the pr process uh oriented stuff right i i would say that's a really apt analogy of it um you know bladesmithing is in it has many common denominators with martial arts. It takes discipline, uh, takes self-awareness. Um, you have to be able to look at your work critically and, and you should be your hardest critic. Um, if you're not, you may not attain the levels that you would like to. 
uh, uh, yeah, it's it's funny when you see someone's scrap pile, someone that you admire, and you see their scrap pile. What are you doing? Like, I'd buy this. What are you doing? Like, no, that's not up to my uh, level of expectation from my own work, you know? I, I have that happen so often. I've got knives sitting in the shop. Um, and, the, you know, man, that's beautiful. What, you know, is that for sale? And, and uh, I say, no, it's got it's got a flaw in it. And and they can't see it, but I can see it. And, you know, if only one of your knives survives, you know, 200, 300, 400, 1,000 years from now, that's the knife you're going to be judged by. Oof, yeah. Right. So I, you know, look, I'm not going to, you know, tell you I make perfect knives. I don't. But every knife that I make, I'm trying to make better than the last one. Well, what, so what is your definition of a good knife? How do you, um, how do you judge your own work and how do you judge other people's work? So um, number one, your design, uh, the design has to carry the knife. Uh, you can put all the fancy materials you want on a knife, but if it doesn't have the lines and form follows function. So if, if you can get that right, the next step is to work on your fit and finish, of course. Um, and I look for per, or as close to perfection as humanly possible in the fit up between the different materials incorporated in the knife. Um, I look for flow. And then most important, it has to function as a knife. Um, I see a lot of really beautiful knives from, you know, even right up close. But then you look at the edge geometry, and the edge geometry is too obtuse. Um, the blade is too thick for the purpose it's intended for. Um, the handle looks great in profile, but it's blocky or clunky. Um, everything that you should take away everything from the knife that's not necessary for the knife to perform. Um, it. It's like a fine shotgun or, or rifle. There's nothing there that doesn't have to be. And then once you hit that correctly, then you can embellish. Um, but if you don't have the, the base product correct and you embellish it, well, you're just putting pearls on a pig. In my yes. Head. Yes. This is, this is why I never trust an abstract painter if i can't see them doing a, a like an excellent portrait right you don't get you don't get to do that <laughs> right yeah and you know the i think that's one of the cool things about being a knife maker um at least making the type of knives that i like to make uh those knives are going to be used and the most some of the most beautiful knives i've ever made the most highly embellished my customers take them in the field <laughs> and they work them. And if they don't perform right, I'll hear about it for sure. Well, do you have any knives in front of you that you can show us? So we have some idea of what you're talking about. I, I do. I'm um, just getting, having gotten back from Alaska. I'm, I'm behind the eight ball, but I've got a couple of knives. Um, one is a large buoy that I, oh. I actually bought back from my collector. This was, the last knife to win the Bill Moran war award directly from Bill Moran. Whoa. Um, and I bought it back and I don't know if you can see that it won um, knife of the year in the Southwestern buoy category for the Moran award. Um, oh man. Wait, wait, wait. Okay. All right. All right. I, I have a lot to say here, but I have to, first of all, that is like, so beautiful it's it's i mean just looking at it uh, don't put it away uh just looking at it it's sort of a dream bowie to me but and i've only glanced at it i love the s guard i love the coffin handle i love the stag and i know that seeing it up close i would love everything else about it but uh, you said it won in the best southwestern bowie category what yes, is that so every year at blade show they'll they'll pick a moran style of knife 
and and that year it happened to be Southwestern Bowie. Um, and so I was competing against guys like Harvey Dean, Tim Hancock, Ron Newton, um, were all in that. And, and I ended up being fortunate enough to win the competition. Uh, it was a big deal for me. Uh, still is actually. So uh, what inspired you to buy it back? Um, I don't really know. I wanted it back. Yeah, I hear uh, that. I wanted to keep it. Uh, and and so at the award ceremony that night, this is kind of cool. Um, Mr. Moran, you know, called me down to receive my plaque. And then shortly thereafter, they were having the auction at our, our banquet. And uh, a gentleman that had painted Mike Huckabee for the governor's office in Arkansas had also painted Bill Moran and you can see that painting right behind me oh, uh, they opened the bidding at six hundred dollars and I bid and nobody bid against me um, so I got it and that was nice. really cool um, and uh, then unfortunately the next year Mr. Moran passed on and uh, I was asked to write a memorial in, in the journal, in the ABS journal for him. Um, so I have the knife, the painting, and the journal. Um, oh, nice. Yeah, it's kind of cool. It's it's kind of, kind of like one of my treasures for sure. Yeah, a, a, a real, like, one of the major feathers in your cap in your career, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, if, you, if you hold that up, can you tell us what... Um, what makes this a southwestern Bowie as opposed to anything else? Another well, you can see it's got a, a reasonably long clip that quite a bit of belly in it, and there's a slight rise before it mm -hmm. drops into the clip. The coffin handle and then the half penny guard. Um, this would be generally thought of as as a pretty typical southwestern buoy, um, and uh, it's it's a big knife, uh, but it's not super heavy. Um, a little heavier than I would typically like, but the stag to get it that wide, I had to, it's a little thicker than I would typically make a handle. Mm -hmm. Um, you can see, I had to roll it in, uh, to match the ferrule okay. there. Um, but it, uh, it's a neat knife. It feels really good. I'm pretty sure you could lop an arm or a leg <laughs> off with it easy um it's it's a cutting implement for sure um i i tend towards lighter knives these days as i've gotten more advanced um you know we're talking almost 20 years ago that i made this knife um and and i just the spine of this knife is about a quarter inch or a little more and you know the older knives the knives of the of the the era Mm -hmm. were typically quite heavy. Um, I like a little bit lighter knife these days. Um, I, I you, think they're faster and, and much more elegant. Oh, yeah, easier yeah. to use. Uh, you mentioned flow before. Uh, when, when you're saying uh, one of the ways you uh, evaluate a knife when you're checking it out is something, one of the words you used is flow. How, how would you describe what you mean by that while holding up that I can, beautiful Bowie. I can describe it easily. So what I want to see is I want the knife to give the impression of motion. Hmm. I want it to look like a sports car or a super fast boat. I want that knife to look like it's meant to move. Um, that's what I look for in, in my knives. Um, you know, unless I'm doing a very specific design that may not lend itself to that. Um, a good example is a Nesmuk style hunting knife, pretty ugly knife, works straight in the field. Yeah. Um, you know, they, they work fantastic, but they're not the prettiest knife in the world. Um, a buoy, a fighter, um, and, and a hunter as well, if it's done correctly, uh, can give that impression of motion. Uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of the time when you're in the field hunting, uh, is it's a waiting game. And 
you know, it helps if you have a really nice bow or a really nice knife or a really nice shotgun or rifle or all of the above. So that when things get a bit boring or you need to you need to wait for a bit, you've, you've got something to keep your mind occupied. You can get it out and take a look at it and it brings you joy. Yeah. Um, and I've spent many hours doing just that. So. Well, uh, so this knife uh, before you or the knife that you're holding in your hand, I can't tell from here whether that's a uh, mono steel or if that's. Uh, it's mono steel. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah. let's let's talk about your process. Uh, you you are a forger. You forge mm -hmm. knives. When you and and design is very important to you, as you indicated earlier. Do mm -hmm. you draw the designs out on paper and then walk into the forge and then try and nail the design that you've drawn, or do you does it come alive while you're doing it? Well, um, it's a little bit of both. Uh, so many many years ago, Tim Hancock and I were designing an introductory in, introduction to forging or bladesmithing course for Sierra Fire and Forge out in California. And uh, we we had to figure out how to teach these guys to forge a blade and you know up to a very high level in a week. And uh, so one of the things we came up with is to make a pattern uh, which we made it out of Lexan, and then we would put that on the anvil and trace it with a Sharpie, and and then you forge until it touches the the lines all the way around. Um, I call it forging to your blueprint, um, not blueprinting to your forge. Uh, I actually got that phrase from a gentleman named Wade Coulter that's a master bladesmith as well and an unbelievably talented one. Well, when you're when you're um, smithing, blade smithing, <clears throat> I, I guess I've always kind of wondered, but never really thought of, too much about it. But uh, you know, there are levels of purity that some people, uh, in an art form or in a craft, uh, try to seek out of uh, a desire to adhere to some rigid uh, uh, process that was laid out before them. Um, and then, and then, uh, others who kind of strike out on their own. And when I think of this, I think of things like, um, whenever I've watched forged in fire and I don't know how you feel about the show. I love it. But whenever I see someone, for instance, drifting in holes for in their tang, uh, mm -hmm. that they're going to use to put pins through, I'm always like, Ooh, that guy, that guy knows what he's doing. Like he's, he's doing it 100% as opposed to, Sometimes you'll see guys cutting out stuff with an angle grinder and heating it up and banging it and then drilling the holes. And I just wonder, like, <laughs> I see you smiling. Like, well, do you and, follow and reason, a purity thing like that? or? Well, the reason I'm smiling is uh, when I first got into this, I, I was in the process of building a power hammer. And my father got on me about it. He said, they did it by hand for, you know, a thousand years before. And it's really unique that you do this all by hand. I had just a hammer and anvil and a forge at the time. And uh, I said, but dad, they didn't do it by hand all that time. Uh, they had lift hammers. They had water powered hammers. They, they had drop hammers. Uh, they also had apprentices uh manpower was cheap uh as a one-man shop you have to learn to maximize your time um i forge very close to shape because it saves me time on the grinder um and i love the forging process uh that being said the goal is to make a superlative knife and I will do what I have to do to produce that knife. Um, if if that means, you know, drilling the holes in the tang instead of hot punching them, then I'll do that. Um, and and but that being said, you as a master smith, you have to be capable of doing all that hot work. Um, and my first mentor al barton was big on that he was brutal on me um i i never i never did good enough 
Um, and I thank him for that to this day. Uh, he was really big on making me forge close to shape and learn how to use the hammer. Um, he said, you should, when you get off that anvil with that blade, it should be just about done. Um, and that being said, there's a few caveats to that. For certain Damascus patterns where you don't want to disrupt the pattern, you're better off forging your profile and not forging your edge bevels in. Um, so it's, it, it's all dependent upon what the end result needs to be. If forging enhances that, then you should do it. If it doesn't enhance it, what's the point? Um, that's kind of where I'm at with it. Um, and if you're, if you're a person out there that's just getting into this craft, um, remember a good friend of mine calls it building in a wreck. Um, sometimes you need to leave a little extra meat in there hmm. so you can bring everything in to as close to perfection as possible. So you want to leave some leeway. Um, don't expect to forge the blade right down to almost final in the beginning it takes a long time um and it takes you know dedication um that being said it's very satisfying when you do it so you mentioned kind of two goals um in you know uh kind of general theoretical goals one is making a superlative knife that's not theoretical we know that you're capable of doing that uh the other thing is if, is efficiency you mentioned something about being as efficient and maximizing your time as possible uh what what's the conflict between creating the superlative knife but also being efficient um you know i don't know that there's there is a conflict actually okay. um for me it, i just go seamlessly from one part to the other i and and that I enjoy all the processes. Um, you know, I have machine tools that I use for certain um, tasks. Uh, you know, I have a surface grinder. Um, that being said, I can make a superlative knife completely by hand. And I've had, I guess, four customers in my career that paid the money to have me do that. But very few people want to pay what a knife like that costs. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, as you get up, as your level of proficiency gets higher and your name is recognized, your prices rise accordingly. But the sh market share becomes much smaller. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is, be versatile be willing to make you know the the five to nine hundred dollar hunting knife and be capable of making the five to fifteen thousand dollar you know buoy dagger art knife whatever um you have to you have to be able to do it all that's kind of the cool thing about it um you have to be multi-talented. You wear a lot of different hats. You know, uh, you work with leather, you work with wood, you work with ivory, you work with steel, you work with laminate steel. Some guys work with, you know, their own crucible steel. Um, it's a, I mean, I don't know how you get bored doing this, really. I uh, I asked Matt, um, Matt Chase, Mm -hmm. Three years ago now, uh, he made a uh, custom. Uh, this was, by the way, commissioned by my father. So it was uh, not something that I worked out for, but my dad was very happy to do so. Uh, and he uh, commissioned a sub hilt uh, fighter, a loveless, my favorite knife pattern of all time, loveless sub hilt fighter. Uh, from Matt. Or... Yeah, yeah, a big bear. Matt mm -hmm. had never made one. I wanted stag and he, and it was a real learning process for him. Um, yeah. and, and it was interestingly, uh, 
it was done on a on a knife that he had never made before, but he's making it for a paying customer. And that's kind of a cool thing because it allows yeah. you to explore, uh, you know, as long as you you know you're good enough to do it, it allows you to explore a new kind of knives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, I've had so many clients subsidize my learning curve. Uh, you know, they've asked for a knife. I wasn't sure if I could do it. Um, and it pushed me. And it made me a better knife maker. Um, sometimes I had to make the knife three or four times till I was satisfied with it. Mm -hmm. And I didn't make any money on it. But I learned. And that's priceless, you know. Um, so it's it's a it's a super cool thing to have happen. So uh, what uh, what part of the process uh, of making a knife soup to nuts? What's your favorite part? And then what's your least favorite part? I don't know if you have one of those, but. Um, I think, I think my favorite part is obviously forging it. Um, next would become, would, would be designing it. Um, my least favorite part is usually grinding the handle because it makes a mess. Um, and, but it's, it's also what, what can quite often take a, you know, pretty common blade and turn it into something special. Um, so I, I used to hate making cheese. Um, and I, I worked with Ron Long a little bit. Uh, Ron helped me a bunch. And, and now I enjoy making cheese. Um, kind, of a, kind of a nice break, actually. So yeah, you've mentioned your customers a couple of times. So who who are your customers, and what uh, what are they reporting back from the field? Um, so I have customers from all walks of life. Um, I have one customer that um, is uh, phenomenally wealthy. Um, I don't know if he's Bill Gates wealthy, but he's not far off, and uh he's a he's a gun guy um he heard about me from from a, a gun maker and uh i would say most of my collectors are are hunters uh that have you know a, a pretty good uh make a pretty good living mm -hmm. um and and what i'm hearing in the field from these guys uh you know, I'm hearing two elk completely skinned and butchered, and it was still shaven, but not quite as good as it was when I got it. Um, when I hear that, I'm pretty happy with that. Um, having butchered a few elk in my day, um, it, it can be hard on the knife. Those bulls rolling in the wallows, and um, they got grit in their hair, and and um uh, it's a big animal so if you can do two elk before you got it and it's still shaven but not quite as good as it was yeah i'm pretty happy with that um, not to say that i'm not pushing for it to still be popping there like it was when he got it but you have to be realistic steel is steel um you can you can only bring a steel to a certain level. You know, you you can there's there's a there's a cap on what you can get that steel to do. Um, some of the newer steels coming out will hold an edge for a very, very long time. Um, I've used some of those steels uh, just in knives that I've taken into the field. Um, I've not found anything really that that performs better uh, than a really good high carbon steel blade um, that's properly heat treated. Um, I think, you know, to quantify the differences between, you know, the steel of the month and let's just say a one, which happens to be one of my favorite steels both being properly heat treated um i don't i don't think you can necessarily tell the difference in the field except the one 
will sharpen a little easier. Um, you put it in a, you know, in a laboratory in a, under controlled circumstances, and the the super steel may may get ten or twenty percent more cuts, perhaps. But that also comes at a price because they quite often won't have the durability. Um, and and what I see is that often the edge geometry will suffer in the the higher end steels of the month, so to speak, um, because they're worried about it not being able to take the impact or mm -hmm. or the the flexing. Um, that being said, uh, I just came out with a production knife and it's, it's M390 and I'm really happy with it. Uh, 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 okay, I want to talk about that obviously in a in a quick second, but I wanted to ask you this uh, about Damascus. Is there any um, benefit beyond the the sheer beauty of it uh, with having uh, in terms of cutting? Is there any cutting benefit to Damascus? Um, you know, I I think that's really hard to quantify. Um, my gut feeling is uh that damascus cuts a bit more aggressively um but i don't think it cuts longer uh, it it has a thirstier edge sometimes um but i think you know i make my damascus and most of the guys out there these days make their damascus out of really good cutlery grade steels, both the bright steel and the, the dark steel. And it's going to perform as good as the steels that are used in it, as long as they're properly heat treated. Mm -hmm. um, I'm perfectly happy taking either one into the field. Um, the one benefit I see with Damascus is, you know, you take a, a nicely satin finished carbon steel blade into the field and eventually it's going to get a patina on it. Um, I don't, I don't mind that. Damascus will get a patina as well, but you can knock the high spots off and it'll look like brand new. Mm. Um, so that is one benefit of Damascus. And, and then, you know, the, the artistic freedom that Damascus gives you, uh, your your freedom of expression with the steel uh and it's one of a kind it, it is absolutely one of a kind um i mean the best damascus makers i know cannot absolutely reproduce exactly the same pattern every single time right, right. um you know if they make three ladder pattern blades they'll be very close in appearance but when you start looking at and counting the rungs you'll come up with a different count um quite often uh and i, I may be talking out the side of my neck here but that's been my experience so you dropped production knife a few minutes ago let's talk about this tell me about your production knife and what this was like i mean to me you're you're so in your uh, you know i imagine you in your forge all the time what's this so um it was a really long journey uh i i wanted to build a folder that i would want to carry and and i'm pretty picky and uh I, I wanted to come up with a lock that would get better with time, not worse. Uh, so I, I designed a knife. Um, it's a full size folding hunter. It's called the Rotoball Infinity Lock. And it's, it's pretty amazing. I love it. Um, and it's super light. It's super thin um and still very 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 strong um as the lock wears it engages more it just gets better over time i based it on uh browning satori 
uh, lock. Uh, and is this a firearm? Browning Satori? Yeah, a Browning okay. Satori. Yeah, it's a over under shotgun, and oh, they okay. they have a reputation for just lasting forever. And so, I made this thing um, in my in my shop, and and then I I went through two different people trying to produce it here in the U.S. and and they either couldn't or wouldn't do it. Um, so I uh, I ended up going to China with this and and I I fought that actually for seven years. Um, but I couldn't find anybody that would manufacture it to my specifications. Yeah. And and that's kind of a sad commentary <laughs> right now. Um, but that being said, if you're willing to pay for quality, they'll give you everything you pay for. And then some. Uh, hold that up to the camera so we can see it. This looks right up my alley. Beautiful. So the, the does the, how does the lock... Is that on top? Does it engage mm -hmm. and disengage? Yeah, so top? the beauty of this is it's just so easy to manipulate. It just, it's super easy. You can use the, the thumb stud. I have them on there, mm -hmm. but I never use it. I just flick it and pop it back in. It's, so who's the manufacturer you have, I, I, or, or do you not uh, disclose? I don't disclose that. Okay, just, that's fine. That's fine. At this point, anyway, I'm well, just yeah. getting the company going. So, yeah, some, um, for for some people, that's their that's a selling point. I know you don't need that as your selling point at this stage in your career, but I know some people like to talk about. It, so, thought yeah. I'd ask. But uh, is the one in your hand? Did you make that yourself, or is that because I believe you had that at Blade Show this year? Didn't you have yeah. this, this knife? Is the, this is the production that knife, is? and that's what I've been carrying hmm. since just before Blade Show. Actually, this is the first time this has been really Shown. close to daylight. Um, I haven't officially released this yet. Um, I'm working on a website right now, I'm waiting on photography. And um, I'll have these, well, they're available now. You can contact me at my email. But um, And uh, so far, they're going great. I've got them out into the hands of some guys that are really, well, they're knife makers. Yeah. other knife makers and they they'll cut me no slack and i'm getting super good reviews so i'm really oh, happy congratulations yeah i i love the knife and and that that says something i mean i know because i designed it and everything i may be biased well, but hold it up know. so we can see it some more hold it up to your camera uh look at that okay so you got contoured carbon fiber you got a very nice uh profile on that handle the lock engages and disengages on the top you've got a harpoon clip point beautiful blade perfect termination of the of the edge you know and the and the plunge grind a lot of people will be happy about that some people hate resharpening their knives because of how the how the plunge grind terminates that drives me crazy <laughs> um when we call them chicken lips so <laughs> when when a guy leaves chicken lips on his knife it serves no purpose and if you have those, you're, it makes it hard to sharpen, as you just said. Um, it, there's no reason to have that. You're um, talking about little flanges on the side, the chicken lips? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah we call them chicken lips. Uh, I love that. I haven't heard that term yet. Yeah. I, I hate them. Uh, we make fun of guys that have those quite often. <laughs> <laughs> Not to their face. Of course not. So uh, in in this in this folder, wait, what are you calling your folder again? Uh, it's the Infinity Lock. The Infinity um, Lock. So mm -hmm. what were you what were you going for? What were your um, design requirements? Well, it had to be super light, um, under three ounces. Uh, I oh, think wow. these come in at two point three or two point four, something like that. That's um, real light. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, it had to be strong. Uh, had to be able to take some lateral uh, pressure. Um, the lock had to be fail safe, um, and it had to be comfortable. And and that this knife kind of has all of that. Um, I I really like the knife. If if you came up to me and I didn't know anything about this, and you said, "Hey, check out this knife." I'd ask how much you want for it. 
um, for sure. So, well, how much yeah. do you want for it, or or is that not uh, settled yet? Well, right now, um, I'm selling them at three forty nine, but I believe that's probably going to end up being the the wholesale price. Um, okay. I've I've had too many guys say that it it should be five six hundred bucks. I could be wrong. I, you know, I don't know, but that's the price. Three forty nine is the price right now. Um, that could move around a little bit, but I didn't want to price it. You know, I didn't yeah. want to make. I'm not trying to make a million off this thing. I'm trying to get a good knife out there at an honest price. Yeah, I mean that's got to be a very difficult thing is figuring out how to price the knife because. Uh, a lot of time goes into designing. A lot of time goes into, um, you know, uh, marketing and back and forth with the company and this and that. Uh, but then uh, at the same time, you also have to see the waters you're swimming in and what are other people uh, making similar knives with similar profile, you know, whatever. What are they charging? And, right. you know, what's the market? That's got to be very difficult. It is. And, and, and I'm still not you know, firm on it. Um, so we've got uh, about 30 left of the first hundred. Mm -hmm. And um, I've got another 200 on order. And 100 of those are going to be um, about, I forget what the reduction was. I think it was a 20, 27% or 28% reduction in size oh okay um so what we are finding is the larger knife this knife uh guys really like it but women don't their pockets tend to be shorter yep and and this doesn't fit safely in their pockets they're afraid they'll lose it um and so my wife is an outdoors woman as well um and she's a hairdresser and she comes in contact with lots of ladies and and quite a number of them are outdoors women as well and they all love the knife and ask if they could get it a little smaller hmm. so um i'll have a hundred of these full-sized and then the smaller ones available in about three months well uh you definitely have the light part down i know um just speaking from uh, my wife, she loves to carry slim, light knives, and then, as you mentioned, it can't be too big because they yeah. they don't they don't give them much for pockets. No, they don't. You know, it it there's just not enough depth yeah. uh, to their pockets, and and uh, you know, I myself typically prefer a smaller knife, but I meant this to be a primary. Mm -hmm. uh, I carried this the whole time I was in Alaska. Um, I used it cutting false azalea and blueberry and huckleberry. Um, I don't know how many times. Um, I think I touched it up one time while I was up there. Nice. Um, and, and I was just super happy with it. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> if I was out there listening to this, I'd, I'd be saying all that. <laughs> that guy, of course he is. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Right, but the guys that know me yeah. know that I'm hard on myself, and and I don't BS. Um, well, I might BS on fishing and hunt stories, but not. <laughs> you should have seen it. <laughs> right. So, uh, but not on knives. Um, I'm very very happy with it. So. All right, James. Be before I let you go, we're coming up. Uh, uh, we're coming up on that moment, but before I let you go, I want to ask you, I, I ask this sometimes with people, especially those who forge knives, I find, but if there's anything that you haven't forged, but you want to forge, uh, you want to make something in the future, whether it's a sword or, you know, I don't know, a certain kind of knife from history, you've done it all. I mean, knowing you, the five knives you had to make for your master Smith mm -hmm. alone, I mean, that that's spiral fluted hander dagger and all that like that stuff is crazy but is there anything that you've always had an inkling to build that you haven't yet that you want to someday um there's a couple things um i've always wanted to build kind of a family sword um hmm. something to pass down and and uh i i haven't it, it'll be germanic uh, because that's my heritage 
Um, I haven't, it's either going to be a Zweihander or perhaps a Fonberge blade. Um, I, I'm not sure yet. And That's the, the wavy, way, the wavy blade, the flamberge. The... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I would, at some point, I would like to take the time to do that. Um, I'm hoping that this thing will allow me to kind of delve off into some of those those more esoteric uh, pursuits. Um, and the other thing I would love to do and and is is make a Damascus flint lock and forge the barrel and then put a Bowie knife and a hawk with it as a set. Um, and, and that will be years, two, three years, maybe more of labor. Um, you know, making the lock completely by hand, making the barrel completely by hand. Um, and, and it won't be for sale. That'll be for me. Oh, I was going to say, you better, you better get your, uh, your super wealthy patron on the line for that one. That sounds pretty amazing, but yeah. That's, I that's talked to him about it actually. And I told him, no, you don't have enough money. <laughs> <laughs> if I built something like that. It's mine. Nice. It's, if I croak before you, maybe I'll leave it to you. So, <laughs> um, yeah. Well, James, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, really appreciate you coming on, taking the time and uh, just talking with you. Um, I, Matt has so many great stories to tell about you. And uh, so we <laughs> skimmed the surface here, but uh, yeah, it's been great. And I can't wait to hear about your Alaska place once it's built. Oh, uh, well, you'll have to come up and see it, man. Oh, uh, I consider that an invitation. So that it, it is um, actually Matt, I think is going to come up next year. And uh, once I get everything dialed, uh, you, you almost have to have a boat. You, well, you have to have a boat in Southeast Alaska to make, to get anywhere, that or a plane. And, and without a boat, you're kind of stuck. Um, so once I get the cabin up and the boat, uh, you'll have to have to come up. And um, it's, it's pretty wild country. Um, the people... The few people that are there are salt of the earth. Um, I mean, walking into our property, you're walking on a brown bear trail. Um, and the way you tell a brown bear trail is there's a, a print, then a print, then a print. They walk in each other's footsteps. Oh, okay. And it sinks into the muskeg and, and makes this trail of, you know, I guess they're about, eh, let's see if I can get it. They're, they're about 12, 13 inches long Jeez. and, you know, yay wide and, uh, and it's just alternating. And, uh, yeah, when you see a, a steaming pile on that trail, the pucker factor goes up. Well, um, I, th I think this suburban dad needs that sort of experience just to round out my, uh, awesome. <laughs> that sounds great, man. It is. Uh, it's cool. I need a change of jungle. That's for sure. Uh, James, thank you so much, Jim. Thank you, you for joining me. I really, really appreciate it. Hey, I enjoyed it anytime, man. Um, look forward to seeing you again. Awesome. So we'll have right to, back at you. Yeah, we'll have to have a we'll have to have a beer at Blade, man. You, me, and Matt will go. go that sounds. Have a beer. That sounds ideal. I'll tell you a bunch of stories I can't tell on film. <laughs> oh yeah! All right, that sounds good. <laughs> All right, my man. Have a good one, sir. Bye, brother. Thank Be you. Good, man. Take All care right, of you yourself. Too. The Shockwave Tactical Torch is your ultimate self-defense companion, featuring a powerful LED bulb that lasts 100,000 hours, a super sharp crenulated bezel, and a built-in stun gun delivering 4.5 million volts. Don't settle for ordinary. Choose the Shockwave Tactical Torch, the knifejunkie.com slash shockwave. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Jim Rodabaugh, James Rodabaugh, professionally a forger of some outrageously amazing knives, especially and including that Bowie he showed uh, that was awarded, uh, given an award by the great and powerful Jim Moran. Uh, rest in peace. The last one he gave, as a matter of fact, uh, very beautiful stuff, but keep your eyes peeled for the infinity lock knife as well. Uh, be sure to join us for uh, Wednesday for the midweek supplemental and Thursday for Thursday Night Knives. For Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer.
Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thank you.